Bonjour et bienvenue. Je suis très content d'être ici avec vous. And unfortunately, that's the limit of my French uh, language skills. <laughs> so today I'll be speaking in English, but I have uh, one thing going for me, and that's that we're mostly going to be looking at cartoons. We're going to be talking today about a lot of the exciting things that are happening in digital marketing. I feel like there's never been a better time to work in digital marketing. There's so many new exciting technologies and platforms and tools that we can use as marketers. But I feel like sometimes our mindset as marketers haven't quite caught up to the potential of that technology. And so today I want to talk about how our mindset as marketers can evolve and take full advantage of all the tools and technologies that we have at our disposal. I feel like too often conversations can sound a bit like this. We need to stay focused on our marketing priorities and not get distracted by every shiny new, look, squirrel! This year will be all about AI. Yes, and podcasts. Yes, and nano-influencers. Yes, and social commerce. Yes, and blockchain. Yes, and voice search. Yes, and live video. Shouldn't we talk about our strategy first? Hello? Anyway, this will also be the year of VR. So it's really exciting, all these tools. At the same time as the pace is happening so fast, our organizations are also struggling to keep up. And we also have conversations that sound a bit like this. Are you ready to meet about digital transformation? We can't see your slides. Do you need to download the video plugin? We're restricted to IE7. Okay, I tried to email the slide deck, but it bounced back. Our file limit is one, ter is, is one megabyte. Dropbox, we transfer, blocked by our firewall. Google Docs, yeah, right. I'm not sure how to present to you. Can you fax it to us? <laughs> so we have those two things in common. We have a massive pace of change, all these exciting new technologies. And at the same time, our organizations are struggling to keep up and adapt. And that's the challenge I think that we have uh, in marketing. We are in what I think of as the awkward adolescence of digital marketing, where many of these tools are becoming available, but we're still figuring out as organizations how to take full advantage of the tools. And in this period of awkward adolescence, we can end up with a lot of situations that are kind of funny, that are, can be frustrating to our audiences and our consumers. This subway has no internet access, but that won't stop us from asking you to scan the QR code on this ad. Or if you've ever seen a QR code on the side of an advertisement on a moving bus, as if you're going to see the ad moving by on the bus and quickly grab your phone and then chase the bus, get the ad up, and it probably takes you to a website that's not optimized for mobile. That's where I think we are in this awkward adolescent stage. Don't worry, it's only marketers collecting our personal data so they can create more relevant advertising for us. I think my Nest smoke alarm is going off. Google AdWords just pitched me a fire extinguisher and an offer for temporary housing. Here's a guy sleeping and his phone is starting to buzz. Goes a little bit further. Finally wakes him up. Having trouble sleeping? $5 off nighttime sleep aid liquid caps. Order Kleenex. Ordering Amazon Basics facial tissues. Um, no, I said Kleenex. Amazon Basics is 50% off the name brand. But I said Kleenex. Kleenex. Here is the weather for Phoenix. Now that we've invested in this marketing tech stack, what's the ROI? That's a good question for a new analytics tool we should buy. Yes, and a new layer for data, data visualization. So that, I think, is a little bit of the stage of where we are, where we're still trying to figure things out. There's a lot of new exciting technology. We're still trying to figure out how to use that technology. And at the same time, the expectations of our consumers have never been higher in terms of wanting us as marketers to get it right. Here's a guy in the airport. All the flights have been canceled. Honey, just be patient. The hotel brand I'm loyal to isn't optimized for mobile. Honey, honey, she said to say she left you for another brand. And this cartoon was inspired by something I read from Google last year that found that people are more loyal to their needs in the moment than they are to any particular brand. 
And as somebody trained in marketing, I found this really shocking because I was trained in marketing that as marketers, if we just find a way to generate loyalty for our brands, our consumers will stick with us no matter what. But things have shifted. People expect their needs in the moment to be met. And that creates a big opportunity for brands that can understand how to deliver these needs in the moment. And a lot of this tools, these tools and technologies will allow us to do that like never before, but we have to evolve and change our mindset to be able to take full advantage of those tools. So here's an example of a brand that found a way to do this. So this is a hotel brand in the United States called Red Roof Inn. And they looked at the same situation I showed in the cartoon, imagining that people are in the airport and their flights have been canceled. There are a lot of canceled flights every day. Weather is a primary cause of that, of, the, of canceled flights. And they thought, you know, we try to compete against big hotel brands. They compete against Starwood, Marriott, big hotel brands that have deep marketing pockets and have budgets where they can do a lot of marketing. And Red Roof Inn has struggled because they're smaller. They try to bid for keywords when people are searching for hotels and they can't afford to outbid Starwood. It's just a bigger company. So they had an insight that they were going to decide not that they, they couldn't out Starwood Starwood. So they were going to try to compete in a different way. And the way that they were trying to compete was to really understand the needs in the moment of their audiences and then, then find technology that they can use to deliver on those needs in the moment in real time. So they looked at that situation of somebody in the airport and their flights have been canceled. And they thought, that's a, that's a situation that we could own. We could be the best in the world at that use case of somebody in the airport and their flights have been canceled. And so rather than bid on every single keyword, they built a simple algorithm that looked at weather data and flight cancellation data. And then they dynamically generate ads in real time to only bid on keywords when there's a high likelihood that flights have been canceled. Flight canceled, Red Roof has you covered with rooms only five, three miles away. And that, I think, captures some of how the mindset can be matched to the technology to really deliver an amazing customer experience. If you just jump on the technology bandwagon and find every new platform that you can sign up for, you're gonna, you're gonna just be one of many out there doing the same thing. But finding the right mindset to fully bring that experience to life and then using the technology to do that, that's, that's what I'm going to talk about today, is how you can find those types of moments. We end up in a situation a little bit like this cartoon. There are two people sitting at a table surrounded by paid media from a big budget brand, and the other person is, having, is saying, I'll have what she's having. That's an example of a micro moment. Google calls these micro moments that matter. And so the first concept I want to share with you today is how to think about these micro moments that matter and then match them against the technology that we have available to really engage with our customers on a deep level. So today I want to talk about a few aspects of this idea. How do you cultivate that mindset? I'm gonna walk through six examples. I'm gonna share cartoons, because I'm a cartoonist, of ways that we can sort of think about evolving our marketing. And I'm gonna share some case studies, um, many of which are not in France, so hopefully will be new to you, and uh, will hopefully inspire you to think about marketing in a new way. But a little bit of a quick background on, on sidebar on my background, because I have kind of an unusual background for a cartoonist. I've wanted to be a cartoonist ever since I was a little kid. These were my three biggest heroes growing up. That's Bill Watterson from Calvin and Hobbes, Gary Larson from Farside, and Berkeley Breathed from Bloom County. So I wanted to be a cartoonist, and I drew cartoons every day imagining that someday I could be a cartoonist. Um, I ended up taking a little bit of a detour in my career. I actually didn't start publishing cartoons, weirdly enough, until Harvard Business School. We had a student newspaper at the school and I started drawing cartoons about student life. And then I graduated from Harvard Business School and went to work in marketing. I was at General Mills, a large American food company, then at Nestle, then a small company called Method, also consumer products. I was interim chief marketing officer uh, at a tech startup called Hotel Tonight. And all along my marketing career, I started drawing basically one cartoon a week. I graduated from business school and I thought, well, I don't have a student newspaper anymore, but there are a lot of funny things to make fun of in the world of marketing. So I would basically draw a cartoon once a week about my day job. I'd send it out to a couple of colleagues. 
Within a few weeks, I had a few thousand followers, and then it grew. And over, ever, ever since I started this, doing this once a week, it's now grown to a few hundred thousand marketers who read my cartoon every week. Um, along the way, I've discovered other, friend, other uh, cartoonists that I admire. My main hero is Jean-Jacques Sampé. He's my favorite cartoonist in the world. And uh, it allowed me, ultimately, to figure out how to put the idea of cartoons and marketing together. I was able to leave my job nine years ago and finally become a full-time cartoonist. And so I now work with other cartoonists in a small studio. We help brands tell stories with the medium of cartoons. So I share a bit of that because I've had kind of an unusual journey in cartooning and, and marketing, and it shaped a lot of my thinking uh, in terms of what I'm going to share with you today. That's a little bit of my background. So the first idea I want to share with you is the idea that there's no longer a captive audience. When I first started working in marketing, I was at General Mills. I worked on a brand, uh, Green Giant, Géant Vert. It's an old brand. It's been along for a very long time. It was one of the classic advertising icons of the last century. And when I arrived at my desk, I started reading all the material that we had on the brand, and I literally found a creative brief written by a young Leo Burnett. And it was amazing to see how marketers thought of marketing back in the early days of marketing. It was very much like Mad Men and Don Draper. And what amazed me in reading this brief was how so many of the assumptions at that time in the 1960s we still assumed to be, tr to be true when I was starting my marketing career. And one of the dominant idea ideas that carried over was that we somehow had a captive audience. Early in marketing history, we only had a few different ways to get our message out into the world. In the United States, there were only three television stations. So the rules of marketing were command and control. If you define your brand and you just market through a few channels over and over and over again, soon enough, people will start to buy what you're trying to market to them. This is what Seth Godin refers to as the TV industrial complex. But the thing is, nowadays, there is no such thing as a captive audience. Your ad ignored here. Just as in many ways, we have more tools at our disposal as marketers to get in front of our audiences like never before, they've, our, our audiences have more tools to block out anything that we want to say to them. They have a lot of control to completely ignore all of the marketing messages that we're trying to get in front of them. And that fundamentally changes the mindset that I think that we need to have as marketers to be able to operate. We can't have a Don Draper mindset and then match them with today's technologies and inspect to make an impact. There's, no, there's not even a captive audience when they're in your store. This pair is so perfect. I can't wait to buy them cheaper online somewhere. What's your Wi-Fi password? And so we have to operate differently. We learn to speak your language so your generation will start to pay attention to our ads. And they respond with the middle finger. Nowadays, marketing looks much more like this. Every one of these nodes and touch points is a place where people discover your brands. Don Draper doesn't know how to operate in a world like this because you can't operate by the same command and control style. There's no captive audience. So here's a quick example. We all love the Nutella brand. It's obviously a brand that a lot of people love. There was a woman in Italy who loved the Nutella brand so much that on her own, she decided to start a holiday. World Nutella Day. She asked people to send in recipes of things you can make with Nutella, send in photos like this guy kissing a big bottle of Nutella. She got a lot of people excited about World Nutella Day. But what do you think the parent company of Nutella did when they came across this campaign? They sued her. They sent a cease and desist letter using the brand without permission, not the right font, not the right brand voice. What a missed opportunity. But I think it reflects this Don Draper mindset. Don Draper believes we control the brand, we define how the brand is marketed, and then we just market directly to our audience, audiences. But it's evolved fundamentally. I support word of mouth marketing just as long as we tightly control whatever they say. Here's another example. How many of you have been to the American state of Kentucky? So not surprisingly, not very many of you. Every state in the United States has a marketing department that tries to market for that state. There's a tourism bureau. They try to get people to visit the state. Kentucky wanted people to visit. 
So they convened their marketing group. They decided to say, how can we market the state of Kentucky? What does our brand stand for? And they came up with a platform they described as unbridled spirit. And then they tried to get people excited about unbridled spirit. Come to Kentucky. They did a lot of work on Facebook. They weren't getting a lot of traction. It didn't really get people excited. Along come these two guys. These guys happen to live in Kentucky, and they also happen to work in advertising. They thought that unbridled spirit was kind of lame. If you Google unbridled spirit, you get a horse ranch in Texas. What does this have to do with Kentucky? So these two guys, on their own, for free, decide that they are going to rebrand the state of Kentucky. So they first came up with a platform they liked a lot better, Kentucky Kicks Ass. And then they decided to try to turn this into a marketing campaign. They traveled around the entire state. They interviewed people, asking them what they like about the state of Kentucky. They de developed media like this. In Kentucky, there are more barrels of bourbon than there are people. And they tried to get people excited about the state of Kentucky. What do you think the official tourism department thought of this when they came across this promotion? We certainly would not sanction or endorse that phraseology. These guys are Kentucky natives and they love the state, but they have a different constituency, which is no one. The internet loves statements like that. And these guys took it and ran with it. Regardless of what Kentucky's tourism department says, we're rebranding the state. A grassroots movement has taken place, driven by proud Kentuckians, the internets, plural, and a little social media. What a powerful force. So you have two guys who are able to rebrand the state. Conan O'Brien, a talk show host, talked about this in his opening monologue. He certainly didn't talk about unbridled spirit. He talked about Kentucky kicks ass. Now that's a fundamental shift because the Don Draper model sees this as a threat and as a risk. But I think today as marketers, we have to grapple with the fact that the balance of power has shifted and our audiences actually control our brand in ways that they never did before. And that's an opportunity. It's also a risk at the same time. And we have to navigate that because if we can find a way to get people excited, people like Sarah Rosso with Nutella, people like these two guys from Kentucky, and then find a way to talk about our brands, that's a powerful force. But it's not to say you give up entire control over your brand. We crowdsourced our financial services ad on the internet. Sooner or later, everything on the internet turns into a cat. If you give total control over to your brand, strange things are going to happen. There is a scientific vessel in England. They decided to have a contest for the internet to pick the new name for the scientific vessel. The internet picked Bodie McBoatface as the name of the vessel. So you give up a lot of control. And I'm not saying to give up control, obviously a part of our jobs as marketers is to, is to ultimately, we have to find a way to market our brands. But I'm saying that we have to fundamentally think about who really controls the message. And the big question we have to ask is, is our marketing fundamentally worth sharing? Is it getting people like Sarah Rosso excited from Nutella? Is it getting people like these guys from Kentucky excited? That's the fundamental shift um, I think we need to embrace as marketers. How do we f acknowledge the fact that we no longer have a captive audience and you use these tools uh, to effectively get in front of the audience we're trying to reach? Okay, the second idea I wanna share with you is the idea that digital can't save boring marketing. There is no sort of uh, lever that we can pull uh, and suddenly have a digital campaign be effective surely by the fact that it's digital. So your marketing plan to sell more soup is live streaming virtual reality 3D printing wearable drones. Maybe we shouldn't have scheduled this meeting right after South by Southwest. And marketers can be guilty of this. We can get so excited about the new thing that we sometimes don't have the strategy behind it. Tell us again how Snapchat will help our brand sell more term life insurance. I may have a big YouTube following, but are you sure I'm a good fit to promote your insurance brand? I'm only 12. Just do something millennial. So the, the thing is that we can't take an experience and that's not fundamentally uh, had, with the right DNA about understanding our audiences in the moment and then expect people to share just because we, we have the right digital tools. 
So I want to talk a little bit about my favorite marketing campaign. And one of the reasons I love this marketing campaign is because it has all the DNA of being a great idea in the world of digital marketing, and yet it's actually a low-tech idea. It had the right DNA at the start. So this is a brand, Innocent, um, out of the UK. I know it's also in France. I had the opportunity to live in London for a few years, bringing an American brand to London. And when I first arrived in London, I came across this brand, and I was immediately struck that all the brands were wearing hats. And I was like, how do they, I couldn't get my head around the bottles wearing hats. And as I learned more about this promotion, I realized that there was, a, there was an interesting process behind it. Basically, if you bought a smoothie bottle at full price, you would get a little hat that the smoothie was wearing, and then 25p would go to an organization called Age Concern that would provide heating oil for the elderly in the winter. So it's basically cause marketing. So I was, in, I was really in, interested about this. How did they do this? How did they pull this off? This doesn't look like a buy one, get one free offer. It's incredibly creative. And then I realized that all the hats were very different and very unique. And I thought, how did they source all of these different hats? And I realized their hats were actually sourced by their own consumers. And that completely blew me away. Because every marketing campaign I've ever worked on, we're trying to promote some consumer behavior. We're trying to get people to click on a link or fill in a form. And these, this brand somehow managed to get people so excited about this campaign that they actually went out and started knitting. And I, I love the, the idea behind this. And the campaign started to take momentum and grow and build. This is inside their actual offices when the hats came in. And you couldn't get more low tech if you tried. You have knitting and you have the elderly. But everything about this campaign, I think, has all the kernels of what makes it an interesting digital marketing idea as well. At the end of the day, which bottle would you pick up in the store if this were up against a, a number, a, a brand that was half price? You'd pick the one with the hat. It has the best story behind it, built into the DNA of the idea. When they ran the numbers on this promotion, they found that, that the lift on the, this promotion was higher than if they had just given the money off at the shelf. So ultimately, having a great idea in the kernel of the story. And the thing is, when they first did this campaign, they did it with nothing more sophisticated than an email newsletter. And that was enough to motivate this type of behavior. You had members of the royal family knitting hats. You had this thing really take on momentum. Millions and millions of hats have been knitted. They've raised a lot of money for charity. And along the way, the brand was built on the back of a promotion like this. And over time, as some of the digital tools became available, they then added those and made those an evergreen campaign. But the big message I want to share with you is that it's not about doing digital marketing. It's about marketing effectively in a, diff in a digital world. And that's fundamentally a shift I think that we need to embrace as marketers. That as we mature beyond the awkward adolescence, we need to think of, our, of what we do less in terms of a, one, of a standalone silo and more in something that touches on every aspect of our marketing. And ultimately, our ideas have to have the right DNA at the kernel of them to really be effective and fully take advantage of these digital tools. Okay, third idea I want to share with you is the idea that customers don't care where they are in the funnel. So we think a lot about funnels in marketing, and it's a useful tool and a mechanism, but so often it can lead us astray. It can give us what I think of as funnel blindness, funnel vision, awareness. Do whatever drives the most traffic, like listicles about cats, Consideration, relentlessly harass them with marketing automation. Trick them with a bait and switch offer. And then hope they promote your brand to all their friends. And the, the trap with this sometimes is that we get so focused on the funnel, we forget what it's like to be the actual consumer in the middle of a customer experience. They don't move in a linear path. And oftentimes the tactics that we use to push them in the linear path can come across as frustrating. Actually, I'm just looking for the bathroom. I had this experience recently, realized that we needed to get a new dishwasher. I came home one day, the dishwasher uh, had flooded the kitchen, there were soap and bubbles all over the floor, and on the display, it just said the letters F-U over and over again. It was sort of insult to injury, which I didn't realize until I Googled it, stood for failed unit. Not great user design. So I was already not feeling great about the brand. So then I went down the path of the typical customer journey. 
And so often we map customer journeys, but we very often use a very one-directional way. And all, I found that so many of the marketing that applied to me at every stage of the journey did not make it easier for me to actually shop and buy a, a dishwasher. Searching leads to clickbait, sites not optimized for mobile, overwhelmed by choice, sifting through fake reviews, unclear tech specs, looking for a number to call, waiting on hold, endless retargeting ads. We may have to get used to washing these by hand. And so it was a real reminder to me as a marketer that sometimes I wear my marketing hat and I forget what it's like to actually be a consumer, to be the recipient of the marketing that we create as marketers and put out into the world. We're testing new digital ad formats that are harder to ignore. And so many of the things we do to try to interrupt, interrupt, interrupt can be exactly the last thing that you want or need. Here are a few examples of those annoying ads, pop-ups, impossible to close, autoplay, oversized, pre-roll, clickbait, retargeting, even though you bought these shoes weeks ago. And then why is everybody installing ad blockers? So we're in a fundamental crisis, I think, in marketing on some of the tools that are most effective by certain definitions are potentially the ones most driving our audiences away. Careful, the last content was full of marketing. And so sometimes I think we forget what it's like to be a consumer. And we often forget what it's like, what consumers are actually thinking about. You know, here's somebody looking at the scan of a consumer's brain, thinking about her husband, career, friends, home. I don't see our brand of pickle relish anywhere. And that's, I think somehow we forget that, we, that our consumers don't think about our brands as much and as frequently as we do. So here's an example of a campaign I, I came across that flips this a little bit, that understands a little about the consumer needs, that gets outside the traditional customer journey, gets outside the typical marketing funnel. Charmin is an American brand of toilet paper. There are lots of places, but they were trying to think how they can do digital marketing. And you can imagine as a brand, how do you get people to think or care about toilet paper? A lot of brands just focus on discount offers, something that can happen inside the store environment, perhaps. But these guys decided to take a step back. They thought about the needs in the moment, much like Red Roof Inn, and they tried to think about where they could provide actual value to their audience. Value as their audience would define it, not just how the brand would define it. They ended up developing an app called Sit or Squat that evaluates public restrooms in cities. So you can imagine traveling someplace you haven't been, you need to find a public restroom. This app gives you a guide. You don't want to go to one that's red. So here's a brand of toilet paper. They found a use case that's connected to their brand proposition, but it was entirely designed around the potential utility of their customer. How would you think about Charmin providing that kind of utility? They expanded on it through other medium to get people to, to think about the brand, but ultimately the app is what it was at the center. We finally found a way to get people to engage with our content. So that is another thing I think to think about is as you get outside the customer funnel, think about actual true utility to the audiences that you're trying to serve and do it, do it on, on their terms ultimately. And ultimately the way I tried to describe this is the idea that the best marketing doesn't feel like marketing. We all know what it's like to be marketed to, finding effective tools that are ultimately uh, of true utility to the audience where they don't see it as something that would be uh, intrusive. Okay, the fourth idea I wanna share with you is the idea of being data-driven, but not being data-blinded. As marketers, we have so much data nowadays. It's amazing the, the, the shift that has occurred in a, such a short period of time, the things that we actually have at our disposal. But this is a real reflection of this awkward adolescence where sometimes we don't have the insights that match up with the data, and sometimes we have things that look really interesting but actually might not be that valuable. So we all have access to marketing dashboards nowadays, vanity metric that has nothing to do with sales, graph that doesn't match any other department's numbers, chart that hasn't been updated lately, a really pretty map, no idea what this is or what to do with it. And so often, that, that's what we have. And it can be easy to make the data tell whatever story we wanna tell. Our marketing program is clearly successful as shown by this graph of how awesome I think it is. 
And so I think evolving and becoming more sophisticated data consumers, actually understanding how to look at data and make and draw conclusions that are actually based on insight, because so often this can lead us to stray. Here's somebody going to their mailbox or finding a catalog with a shoe, then a billboard ad for a shoe, display ad for a shoe, radio ad for a shoe, TV ad for a shoe, finally buy the shoe. Based on the data, we should move 100% of our spending to mobile. Are the digital ads we buy actually being seen? Absolutely. Almost half the time. At least 50% of the pixels for a whole second. Hopefully by a human. Maybe on a site without porn. But there's no way to verify that. That explains the low CPM. Yeah, it's a great deal. And that data can often lead us to decisions that seem good according to the metrics that we're optimizing for, but can actually be really frustrating. So if you try to unsubscribe from a marketing newsletter, this will give you a really vivid display of how this can be, be perceived in real life. So obviously a marketer is trying to minimize the number of unsubscribes and to keep their newsletter list large, but you can end up with this situation like, like this. Tap the link mark unsubscribed. There it is in four point white font on a white background. Verify your identity. Street where your uncle lived in 1994. Manage your preferences. Pause for an hour. Only send one email per day. Unsubscribe to this email, but keep all of our other marketing emails coming. Why would you like to unsubscribe? I don't like to save money. I'm an idiot, all of the above. Are you sure you're a quitter? And then 404 error. <laughs> so this type of situation in marketing, I think, is driven by not really understanding data in its full picture. If you optimize for the metric of minimizing us unsubscribes, you can completely miss the data picture of how happy our customers actually are with our product or service. So the big lesson here is that not everything that counts can be counted. Not everything that can be counted counts. So being more sophisticated in how we consume and make sense of the data that we have at our disposal. Okay, the fifth idea I want to share with you is the idea that marketing is too important to be left to the marketing department. Our previous speaker, Tamam, talked about this in terms of organizational change, a lot of things that are happening in the world of marketing. And a lot of this has to do organizationally that marketing is bigger than those of us in this room. Everybody in our extended organizations impacts how our customers receive and experience our brands. And so finding a way for them to bring them along for the journey, finding a way for them to be part of the extended marketing experience should be a big part of our job. Because we can end up with experiences like this. I placed an order on your website and it still hasn't shipped. Well, it could be a problem with our web team or our technical team or our fulfillment team or our inventory team or our payment team, but I can't access their systems so, so there's no way to tell. Aren't you all part of the same team? No, I'm only in charge of excellent customer service. So ultimately, everybody in the extended change is part of our marketing uh, team. And so often, marketing is one of the parts of our organizations that get the most siloed, particularly digital marketing, particularly because it's new and directly relates to why so few organizations have fully adopted digital throughout their customer experience, because it's hard. Now that we've agreed on the marketing technologies we need, let's move quickly to integrate them into our operations. You're up against a struggle here. This is what uh, Scott Brinker describes as technology changes exponentially, organizations change logarithmically. And those of us in this room are on the front line of that because we're seeing all of the technology that's available and it's a struggle to bring that to life inside of our organizations. This is a, a statistic I found from Forrester that found that 21% of organizations feel that they are finished with digital transformation, that it's done. Rather than something you do on an ongoing basis, that it's something that's done. And I feel like so often that's how organizations can see what we do in marketing, that it's just a tick box and we can move on to other things. Ultimately, we have to bring the extended organizations along for the ride. This was our compromise with legal. Every other department in the extended organization can ultimately impact how our brand is received by the broader world. So finding a way to bring them along for the ride. This can be a challenge with something like digital. Sometimes there's a chief digital officer that's a separate group, and you can end up with the org chart unto itself. The bottom right is manager of business results vacant, VP of buzzwords. 
And then you often find organizations that are doing this in a tick box way in a very junior level. Your job is digital transformation. It's not just about disruptive technology. We need a whole new way of thinking across the entire organization. This is one of our top priorities. We're all counting on you. So good luck on the summer internship. <laughs> I'm here to recruit a digital native to replace my VP of marketing. <laughs> so this is a journey for the entire extended organization. And I've, I've realized early on in my marketing career the power of bringing along the extended organization along for the ride in marketing. I worked uh, for a period of time with a small consumer products brand called Method. It's a brand of ecologically friendly uh, household cleaners out of San Francisco. And I had the job of bringing this brand to Europe for the first time. We set up an office in London. We started with just a few of us, um, it then grew the UK brand. Eventually, it's extended into France and other places in Europe. And we had limited resources, so we had to use the extended teams. One of the areas where we struggled with our limited resources as a small brand was how you actually do customer service. And out of necessity, because we couldn't afford to have a call center, we actually had the phone number on every bottle ring a special phone inside of our office, and everybody on our team would take turns talking to actual consumers. So this is a friend of mine named Phil King. He ran our supply chain. He's taking a turn with our clean phone to talk to an actual consumer. And it was incredibly inconvenient at first, and it wasn't intended to last forever. But during the period of time that we had the phone ringing in our office, it had a pronounced impact, impact on everybody in the company because we were all talking to customers every single day. You'd be in the middle of a marketing presentation, and then next thing you know, you're talking to somebody who has trouble with a stain on their counter, countertop, and they have a question for you and your brand. And ultimately, it taught all of us in the extended team, how can we be stronger as marketers, even if we're not classically trained in marketing? And there are a lot of brands that can bring the customers into the room in interesting ways. So here's one example, the brand Zappos. They're famous for their customer service. One of the stories I love the most from this brand is that they have an award for who can stay on the phone the longest talking to a customer. Anybody want to guess what the record was for the longest phone call with a customer? I heard eight hours. The winner, this guy right here, Steve, not quite 24, that's good. <laughs> Steven Weinstein, phone call with a customer, 10 hours and 43 minutes. He took one bathroom break, and the rest of the time his colleagues brought him food, but he stayed on the phone for that length of time. And obviously, what's the ROI on a 10 hour and 43 minute phone call that resulted in one purchase of a pair of Uggs? What it did symbolically in the rest of the organization is that it showed everybody we're going to reward that level of customer insight and customer attention, and it changed the culture of the entire brand. And it went counter to what can often happen. Great job keeping your average handle time so low with an air horn on the phone. I had a similar experience a few years ago. I interviewed with somebody at Apple early in my marketing career, and the vice president of the particular division at Apple told me that every Saturday, just for fun, not as part of his job, he would work part of a shift in his local Apple store. And nobody else there knew that he was a VP at Apple, but it gave him a chance to actually get in a store with actual customers and have customer conversations. And that he found so valuable for the rest of the way that he did marketing in his organization. Anybody know what this picture is? So if you bought the very first Apple Macintosh back in 1984 and you took the hood off of the Mac, you'd find the signatures of every single person who helped bring that Mac to life. It wasn't just the engineers, but it was the designers, it was supply chain, it was everybody on the team. They all felt like they were part of the product launch of this, of this product. Imagine how you would feel if you were in supply chain and you signed this product before you had shipped a single unit. You would make sure that it was delivered on time in full. That, I think, is, is what we need to bring across in, in more of our marketing, to bring our extended organizations along for the ride as part of the marketing organization. At Method, the cleaning product company I worked for, we, we really tried to think about this and bring everybody in the extended organization. We found a way to tell marketing stories in un, un, unexpected places. We ended up building our first factory and trying to tell our marketing story inside the factory itself, even though most customers wouldn't see it 
because we wanted people working in the factory to feel like they understood the brand and were actually part of the overall brand experience. Every one of these touch points, whether people worked in whatever functional groups they worked in with the method, we thought of as part of the extended marketing team because they all had the ability to carry on a piece of the brand message and actually impact our direct customers. This story from Innocent Hats, one of the reasons I love it so much is because the person in charge of the factory is just as much a part of the marketing team as the marketers on the actual team. The person who thought it was a good idea to ship all these hats and very inconveniently open up all these cases and stick a hat on every bottle. It's so easy to kill this type of idea, and a lot of organizations do, but if we can think about bringing our extended organizations along for the ride, the impact is so significant. The head of Creative for Innocent describes a brand as made up of thousands of nice little touches, which I think is such a great description of what a brand is all about. Then the final thing I want to share with you is basically how do you get started? How do you make an impact? How can you take an idea and bring it into your organization and actually have it take root? Something that you're going to hear at this conference for the next two days. And the idea I want to share with you is something I call Trojan mice. We all know the Trojan horse sort of example, the big horse that you kind of slide in through the, the gates. Trojan mice are like that, but they're small. And I feel like we need to think along these lines in our organizations because companies are, can often be very resistant to change. But if you have a lot of small ideas that can slide under the gates, those can be the ones to sometimes take root. And that engenders a little bit of this culture that was referred to in the, by the last speaker as learning how to fail, learning how to try things in a small stakes way, and then see what happens when it grows. Because bringing ideas to life can often feel tricky. You're in this big circuitous maze and there are minotaurs and the VP of no. It's very easy to kill an idea in most organizations. Organizations are far better equipped with, <laughs> with tools to smash ideas rather than to foster them and to make them stronger. So it takes those of us in this room a lot of creativity and initiative to actually bring ideas to life. And this is a quote I love from someone at a, at a tech company called WordPress. Usage is like oxygen for ideas. You can never fully anticipate how an audience is going to react to something you've created until it's out there. That means that every moment you're working on something, without it being in the public, it's actually dying, deprived of the oxygen of the real world. And so that's a lot of our goal, I think, is to try to find some oxygen to our ideas and actually breathe some life into them, which runs counter to the way things often work. We're having a focus group to test which questions to ask in our next focus group. So I want to share an example of one of my favorite brands that really embodies this. Um, the name of the brand is Beta Brand. I'm curious how many of you have come across Beta Brand. Not that many. It's not surprising. It's a small brand in San Francisco. Part of their name, Beta Brand, means that they're sort of always in beta. And they make clothing. They're a fashion brand. They compete against Gap and Banana Republic. And they decided that they were going to try to compete in a different way. They couldn't out-gap the Gap. So they were going to try to succeed by, the, by having the most innovative, exciting ideas and to constantly be trying new things. So they challenged themselves when they launched that they were going to launch one new product every single week. And they would manage their supply chain locally, so they would launch something on their website. If it worked, they could easily scale up. If it didn't work, they would scrap the idea. And they would lower the risk of failure. So that if an idea didn't work, they didn't carry a lot of inventory and instead they could move on to the next idea. So you'd wait for the next kind of idea that would come along. One of their first big breakthroughs was launched just around American Thanksgiving. It was called the gluttony pants. It had an extra button to make a more room in your trousers for the American Thanksgiving meal. This did well enough that they decided to, to extend it and launch a product for each of the seven deadly sins. My favorite was a pair of trousers called the Envy Pants. They made only one pair and they sold it on eBay on auction model. And along the way, people started talking about this brand. Some of the ideas they came up with, like a pocket for your banana, were not successful. But others, because they had this model of trying to not being afraid of failure and launching new ideas, some of these were incredibly exciting. These were for biking to work. You can pull out the back pockets and they're reflective so the other automobiles will see you. This was so successful, they launched an entire category around clothes that you can wear when you're cycling to work genes that prevent RFID scanners. Then eventually they expanded it to make it an entirely crowdfunded uh, clothing company. So people, anybody can supply ideas and they'll put them up. And if they do well, they'll actually make those articles of clothing. And along the way, um, some things have not stood the test of time, but other things have been incredibly successful. 
and allowed them to react very quickly. When Mark Zuckerberg was in the news a lot for doing the Facebook IPO wearing a hoodie, they quickly launched the executive hoodie. This dress looks pretty innocuous, and then you zoom up and realize it's the poo emoji on your phone. And gradually, they got talked about. And this was the, the breakthrough product for them. Up until this point, the majority, the vast majority of products that they created were for men. They launched dress pant yoga pants, so the yoga pants that you can actually wear to work. And this entirely transformed the company to be where currently 75% of their sales are to women. And they ended up expanding this dramatically. But they learned from their audience. They realized that they weren't the best gauges of what were good ideas and what were bad ideas. So that's the big idea I want to share with you, is to bring more oxygen into the room. Eventually, they expanded it. So they provided a, a system to re reward people for s taking pictures of themselves wearing their clothes. And in return, you would get a discount, but you would also get a version of their website that looked like you were the main model for their company. And so if you're this guy wearing a Red Devil smoking jacket, you can share this with all of your friends. And along the way, the entire brand was built up by breathing oxygen into it by everybody who are their ultimate customers. And they realized that what they were selling was not just these clothes, but it was the stories these customers could tell about themselves wearing these clothes. And an entire, the entire brand was built on the back of this with very little money to today, many millions in sales, even though they're relatively small, on the backs of doing things like this winning at ideas, putting more creative ideas out into the world, and using digital marketing tools to really understand these needs in the moment. And this is my, my favorite picture. This person is skydiving into Burning Man, which is a pretty amazing thing, but he's doing it wearing these trousers from Beta Brand, and Beta Brand is giving a site that allows him to share that with everybody he knows. And that ultimately builds the brand, not about telling stories about itself, but allowing its customers to tell stories about themselves wearing the brand. I've really enjoyed spending time with you this morning. Thank you so much for having me today. Merci beaucoup. Thanks a lot, Tom. Very exciting. Do you have any questions in the audience before going to lunch? So I just will ask you one last question. What would be the best advice that you would give to the marketers here? I think the, the best idea, touching on what uh, our previous speaker, Tama, was alluding to around uh, elevating our skills. He mentioned CMOs elevating our skills. I think everybody in marketing needs to elevate our skills, particularly when it comes to understanding our impact on the full business. I think so often we're very good at looking at uh, metrics and data within a small area, but I think understanding the full P&L, all the way through the P&L, and understanding how what we do impacts the P&L in the short term uh, and in the long term will keep us focused on the big picture and not get, uh, and not get uh, funnel vision where we're focused on one small thing. So I think we can have a lot of impact to organizations, but we really, we really I think, need to demonstrate uh, at a higher level how we can impact the, the organization at large. Thank you so much.